Hey everybody, it's Ronnie, and today I am sitting here talking with a man who has done a lot of great films recently, <laughs> and his name is Mark Savage, and we're here to talk about, mostly about Painkiller today, your newest film with Bill Oberst Jr. and a couple other great names. Um, so thank you for meeting with me, I appreciate it. How are you doing? Hi, <laughs> Ronnie. Pleasure to be on your show. <laughs> thanks, thanks. So yeah, um, mostly we're meeting today to speak about painkiller your new film that you just directed written by tom pornell um first off let's let's do that age-old question that you know everyone's got to ask and they don't want to hear it from me because they're here <laughs> for you so um tell us about painkiller hopefully without any spoilers <laughs> okay all right I'll, I'll do my best to avoid avoid spoilers <laughs> um yeah um painkiller was um it actually had a sad inspiration the sad inspiration was um my co-writing partner tom parnell his son um died of an opioid overdose a few years ago and uh he was only 21 years old so um you know just literally starting his life really terrible you know just you know really really tragic and uh we were already debating what film we were going to do next and we thought, well, we wanted to do another thriller, but we weren't quite sure what our subject was going to be. And we made a decision that we were going to make something that was going to address the whole idea of how, you know, um, opioids, you know, painkillers um, become like an epidemic, you know, in the US. So let's make a film that kind of sort of vigilante style film where the guy, instead of targeting like, you know, gangs or, you know, street toughs or, you know, people bullying other people, um, let's go after the pharmaceutical industry uh, and not just the necessarily the people who are selling drugs on street corners, because, but let's go after the people really behind it, which are mostly the executives and also the politicians. So essentially about one guy who's targeting pharmaceutical executives uh, at the marketing end, also at the production end of pharmaceuticals, and he teams up with another doctor, a good doctor, um, to help take down parts of the industry. And at the same time, there's also a character played by Michael Pere, who represents the bad side of the uh, pharmacy industry, because we're not necessarily saying that opioids don't have a place in a specific, for a specific reason. It, we're, we're just saying that the industry, though, has manipulated and exploited people's pain. And by not just marketing their drugs to the people who really need it. They, they, they made plans. I mean, they literally sat down and made plans. So how can we make more money doing this? And let's make more money by targeting the drugs at people who don't even really need them. So it's about these two guys sort of taking down those people, but it's done like within a thriller, sort of like a thriller structure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Definitely. Definitely changed the market when they decided it's not just for people who need it for help. It's let's just to see who all we can get profit off. Yeah, of. yeah, and, <laughs> and and doing that was initially illegal because it was actually called off-target marketing. You know, because if you know, because when they get approval, you know, the approval for these, you know, as you know, they're really strong drugs. So the approval for a particular drug is given because okay, that's for cancer patients. So okay, approved. But then what happens, they then start doing what's called off-target marketing is that, well, let's also market it to someone who comes in and says, I've got a backache or my knee, my knee hurts. And then that person starts going on painkillers that were intended for someone feeling, experiencing a very different type of pain and only for a, a temporary use too. Mm -hmm. And people become very addicted to it because if you're in terrible chronic pain for a long time, you do want relief and suddenly you've got this amazing relief. It's like, geez, I like this. But then you have the addictive quality and that's where everything starts going downhill. So knowing that this was more of a, a personal story for Tom Parnell, um, did you approach the filmmaking any differently or like? Um, I wouldn't say we approach the filmmaking any differently in terms of certainly the way of, um, you know, structure, you know, structuring the script and, you know, cause the first thing we always do is that we, you know, we'll, we'll, stru we'll structure it and do like an outline, 
you know, like this is what, you know, like our overarching thing would be, okay, this is what's going to generally happen. Then we sort of like break it up into the three acts and then we kind of work at how we want to structure it in terms of, well, this is the main plot point, the end of act one. This is the main plot point, the end of act two, start developing characters. So that part of it wasn't any different, but what was different was, you know, just, I feel even as a filmmaker, me taking a fairly, you know, sensitive approach to Tom's participation because, you know, it's very kind of sensitive for him, you know, like he's dealing with something that's so close to home to him and, you know, losing a child is not something that you, you know, ever would be getting, you don't actually get over it. You know, it's something that you, you know, learn to accept, you know, learn to adjust, um, you know, you make adjustments in your life for that kind of loss, but it's the worst loss ever because, you know, naturally your child should die, you know, after you, Yeah. you know, like that's, that's natural. So it's such an unnatural thing to have a, a child, you know, die before you because it's completely out of sync with the way that, you know, the natural world actually goes. So, yeah, I was quite sensitive in making it. And I did definitely notice sometimes when we were shooting, Tom would actually leave the room occasionally because, you know, he was on the set, of course, um, and he would leave the room occasionally. And he's in the film as well. You know, he plays a good, yes. he plays a good doctor. A good doctor. Um, that, yeah, he did have periods where he said, I'm, you know, I, oh, I can't listen to that or that's really hard for me, so I'm not going to be there for that. So, yeah, it was definitely adjusting for um, his own sensitivity. But he also said, you know, early on to me, he said, you know, I don't want you to definitely go soft on what we're doing here just because I'm here. You know, like still, you know, whatever we're attacking, you know, whatever um, we're, we're doing, you know, he still wanted me to, you know, not sort of hold back on the way that things were portrayed and the way that we're kind of like addressing addressing the issues. Half the time, I think his attitude was, well, just pretend like I'm not here and still do it. Don't think that, well, Tom's here, so maybe we won't do that. Um, no, he was always definitely all for making something that was fairly strong. So I am curious about casting. How, because um, you've got, um, like you said, Michael Perry is in this. You've got the legendary Bill Oberst in this, um, which you've worked with before. Yes, yes. Um, and then uh, Camila Gaston. I love her. You've got her in this. Um, oh, I love, I love hearing you loved her. That's <laughs> she's great. Oh yeah, she's amazing. Um, so I'm curious, did you did you have an idea of who you wanted to cast in this going yeah, forward? So, or? Yeah. Um, so I'd worked with Bill previously in a film called Stress to Kill. And Stress to Kill, this film in a, in a sense is like an unofficial extension of the world of Stress to Kill. Because Bill plays the same character in Stress to Kill. And in that one, he has a daughter. So if you were to watch that one, you would also then see his relationship with his daughter. So you get the, you then see how Painkiller, he's lost his daughter in that one. So there's been that kind of like time gap between the making of that and the making of this one, because we did another one in between called Purgatory Road. So Bill seemed like the ideal person for this. So when we were deciding how we wanted to do it, we said, well, why don't we actually do it with Bill from Painkiller? No, I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> <Stress -tica. laughs> My head's spinning. Um, yeah, let's get. You've made Bill a from... lot of movies. I'm surprised you can keep <laughs> yeah. track. <laughs> yeah, so let's get Bill from Stress to Kill, and also um, Tom also plays Bill's doctor in Stress to Kill because in Stress to Kill, Bill it's about Bill having a heart attack at an early age. You know, he's like 45, and he goes to the he goes to see a heart surgeon played by played by Tom, who's a doctor, and the whole concept is Tom says. The only way that you can get rid of the stress in your life, you've got to start eliminating the causes of the stress in your life. And the causes of the stress are people. So in that one, so Bill is not a stranger to killing people, except in stress to kill, he's killing the people who are driving him nuts. And it's even stuff like, you know, probably relate to this one, people on their cell phones during movies, things like that. You know, things that have become very irritating, especially when you're a cinephile, as clearly you are and I am, that, you um so it was about that so that's why this one it was kind of their natural to go let's bring bill across and then it was like well who's going to be like you know who's gonna who's he going to work with you know who, who is who else is he going to bounce off then it's like well why don't we extend the doctor's role so it became tom with michael Perret, i'd met michael a couple of years earlier and um we'd sort of gotten into a um you know we were on like a speaking um type of relationship we were talking occasionally and emailing back and forth and, you know, he kept saying, you know, let's work together. And I said, yes, let's work together. So that was like something that completely made sense um, then to cast Michael in that role. 
But for the other roles, I brought in a very good friend of mine who did a lot of casting and gave us a lot of options. Her name's Eve Gordon Litchfield, and who's also in the film. She's the first voice you hear when Tom speaks to someone on the radio. And she says, I lost my son. So in a way, she's expressing exactly Tom's situation, even though Bill in this film is also in a way has gone through what Tom went through. So Eve started sending me bunches of actors um, to look at. I always like to work with, you know, good casting um, agents and she's very good. And one of the people was Kamala Gaston. And I think she gave me about 20 choices um, of actresses for that role. And Cam um, Camilla Gaston was just, heads and shoulders above everybody else. And I'd never seen her before. I wasn't really aware of much of her work, but just instantly, I just thought, she's just amazing. You know, also she's got such an interesting look as well. She's just got a really unique appearance, unique delivery, just unique style, incredible eyes. I mean, just, I mean, I could go on forever. <laughs> it was kind of like, she, she's gonna be absolutely great in this role as, as, as this detective who's sort of like in a clandestine way is working with Bill, giving him information, that type of thing. So I really love, it's really great to hear you talk and um, that you love her too, because uh, yeah, I mean, she was, um, and she was, um, weren't, weren't quite sure where she was living at the time because we're mostly casting locals, but often when you cast locals, um, people even who are not local will often just say they're local. So to, to actually get, um, to get in. And I, I think that's what she did, which we appreciated in a way, because, you know, it takes a big sacrifice to do that. Um, but yeah, I was so happy with her role. I mean, and, you know, Shelley worked on the film for like a day. Um, but also what was interesting is that when, when I cast her, it wasn't until I cast her that I then thought, I really think that her character needs to die. <laughs> <laughs> I know that sort of sounds like a weird thing to say, but initially we weren't quite sure whether, whether she was going to die or not. But then it made sense because even though they had, you know, they had basically targeted a certain amount of people in their business, the problem wasn't over. And so he wanted to kind of create the, create the sense that she would be, that she would be um, one of the last victims of the bad guy of Paray and his kind of like circle um, that they somehow had found out about it. And Paray's final guy, the guy who worked with Paray is like his henchman. The final thing he did was kill her. And even though Paray, I, I mean, I won't say exactly what happens with Paray, but yeah, it, it made sense. Um, I, I know I've kind of given that away now with her, but um, it kind of made sense because she just was, I just think she elicited so much emotion in me um, from her audition that I thought to myself, oh, I definitely, I think that she needs to have some sort of fate that's a tragic kind of fate because I think that's going to really um, get people, you know, sort of emotionally, sort of really emotionally invested in the repercussions of, of, of the business. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the actors, you know, Scott Skurlock, who plays, who plays Strauss, um, the elderly gentleman who works with um, Perret, Scott Skurlock, and um, also um, the actress who plays Lisa, uh, all those actresses came, you know, from Christina e. Berenger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Christina Berenger, who I thought was great too. Scott Gaver, um, you know, all um, all those people were people that were presented to me by Eve, and I, and you know, amongst other people, uh, I just felt that they were the, they were the best. And I think definitely one of the most um, one of the things I love most about making films is the casting. I think it's just great discovering people, and um, also just giving people opportunities who often, you know, some because often people will sometimes obsess over, well, I don't have a reel because I get this all the time. Some actor saying to me, well, you know, I'd love to audition, but I don't have a good reel or whatever. And I, my answer is always, it's got nothing to do with having a good reel. It's got, it's got to do with being right for this role. You know, I mean, I'm never going to, I'm never going to, for example, look at someone's audition and I love it and then say to myself, well, I need to see a really good reel. No, the, the audition is the most important thing because you're not auditioning, you're auditioning for a specific part. You know, it, it, it doesn't necessarily matter to me um, what's in the real. You know, um, if you're good for the part, then that's all that matters. I always think sometimes the real is just probably what gets most people typecast. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's actually a very good point. Yeah, because people are often kind of like forced to make a decision about, well, how do I want to come across in this real? So they then go, oh, well, I'll focus on romantic roles or action roles or whatever. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a, I think that's a really really good point Ronnie that it's a um that if you're just 
not getting someone focused on the real, then almost it's almost more like, well, I can do anything. And I really do believe that really good actors can do anything. I mean, it's the same like the guy I cast as the priest in the last film, um, Gary Cairns, you know, he said to me, oh, I was really happy that you cast me in this role because I'd never done anything like that. But I just said, well, your audition was already good. I'd already seen you in a few other things that I just knew you could do it because you're a good actor. <laughs> nice, nice. So um, you you brought up that um, Camila was only on set for one day. So I'm mm -hmm. curious, how long did it take you guys to film this? Um, oh, yeah. I mean, this was a pretty short shoot um, and it made it so tough. I mean, the whole shoot was about 13, 14 days. Oh, really? Yeah. So it was very, yeah, because we had a lot of restrictions on it, um, a lot of restrictions in terms of locations we could use. Um, so it sort of got into a situation of in order to do it um, the way you wanted to do it, we had to do it in a really sort of compact kind of, um, you know, very streamlined, very streamlined way. So yeah, it it's 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 definitely not easy doing a feature in that amount of time, uh, unless the whole thing is shot in like a room or like one house. But as you can see from watching it, this is not just shot in one place. You know, we're yeah. outside a lot and we're in a lot of locations. There's a lot of action. There's a lot of drone stuff. There's stuff with guns and squibs and stuff. And that's what kind of makes it difficult because it's not it's not necessarily simple. And especially when you're doing stuff with action and guns and squibs and water. I mean, I even did a fall into water myself. So the whole point is, even when you do stuff with um, all those elements, I mean, that's what kind of slows it down. Like in terms of, gee, can we do that in that amount of time? But you know, yeah, had a really good really good crew. And um, you know, I I guess you know, great line producer. Um, you know, she was great. Lauren R Lauren Rayburn is fantastic. Like very underrated. Um, position i think you know line producing is one of the toughest jobs on any movie uh she did a great job uh yeah really good crew uh, great sound recordist as well you know i mean just everybody you know did a good job understood that this is something that's going to move fast and i'd say also my own experience having done you know quite a lot of films and a lot of stuff with action and that kind of thing you know i'm able to definitely say well I, whether it can be done for that you know because often someone will say are you sure this can be done for this and often i'll say no this can't but if we do this this and this i think it can I, that you know, I think I've at least learned. I can kind of estimate a day pretty well. You know, I can look at a scene and go three hours, four hours. Even when someone else would go four hours, you really need four hours to do that. I go, no, no, that needs four hours. But then another time, I might say, oh, I only need two hours for that. When they might say, don't you need like longer? I go, no, two for that because you're always making decisions within your own head too as to how you're going to cover it. You know, because sometimes you might go, well, I'm only going to need two two angles on that scene because. Um, that's the way I want to focus it. You know, it's only focused on a particular element because every time when I'm deciding how to shoot something, I always say to myself, what's it about? What's the main point of this scene? And then that in a way kind of determines how you're going to cover it. You know, that's, and then, that, so that's when you can say, yeah, can do that in two hours, need four hours for that one. You know, this one can, you know, you're, you're always making those determinations. And I think you definitely get better the more films you've made. I mean, I've made, yeah, made quite a few films. And I also made a lot of films even when I was a kid, Super 8 films, you know, so that gave me a lot of experience just in terms of um, feeling confident to be able to like estimate how long something's going to take. <laughs> Been doing it since a kid. Yeah. So, I have. <laughs> when did you guys, when did you guys film this? Oh, it was filmed in um, January 2020. Oh. So, so just before all the lockdowns. Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah, it was very good timing because I got back from Florida um, in like, yeah, mid-February and pretty much a few days after I got back, um, everything kind of changed, you know, the COVID, the COVID and lockdowns and all that kind of stuff. So it meant that they pretty much did all the post through the lockdown. So um, I started doing the editing with the editor, um, Chris Roth, sitting down with him but then within about a month or so, it changed to doing it on Zoom, just like, you know, <laughs> you know so, so I was looking at cuts on Zoom and making notes and that kind of thing. So, I mean, Chris did like a first uh, rough cut, then I did like copious notes. And usually in the past, I would go in there and sit with him and we'd work on things and sit around for days and, you know, trying things and that kind of thing. Didn't really happen that same way here. So it was more like he'd send me cuts, I'd make notes. He, It was fast still, you know, it was like a good way to do it. And within about six to seven weeks, we had a locked cut. Because again, I needed to kind of do it like that because all the other stuff, like 
I had to send a lock cut to Glenn in Sweden. I also had Kelly in Australia who was doing the 4K conform, the color grade and all the CG. So they were all on timetables because they had other work as well. So I, I so the lockdown didn't really impact the post. Um, in a way, it was kind of like a, um, it was, I, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say it was a negative for the post-production part. It meant that everyone just could stay at home and just focus on, focus on the post. And um, the entire process, I think we actually, I think I had like the final version by about um, beginning of August. That was a complete and final, utterly final version. Like it was like a 4K, you know, HD ProRes 444 4K version that would be the one that all the other versions would actually be, you know, extracted from. Hmm. Okay. I'm always curious with COVID because it's just, you know, the whole, everything, yeah. everything has changed. And oh yeah. I'm yeah. Um, curious how much will be, how much of it will be taking going forward as things, you know. Yeah, go, I know it's a very good, normal. it's a very good question. I mean, I'm doing it. I'm actually doing a new film in, in early July and I know that one, um, there's definitely more restrictions and more kind of rules about what we're doing, you know, what we're doing on that one. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think with me, just focused on just focused on post and also focused on other projects with Tom as well. You know, we also have other projects that we're working on um, in addition to this. So we're able to just spend time doing that. And, uh, and also me just developing a lot of other films with um, both Tom and with other producers as well. Um, so, you know, try to take, advantage of the um in a way try to take advantage of the fact that everyone's everyone's kind of indoors um to do indoor indoor stuff <laughs> um so is painkiller a one and done or is there a possibility for more of the story uh, yeah i would i would definitely say and um since you've watched the movie you know that there's kind of like a hint of things <laughs> continuing in a particular scene near the end of the movie um yeah so no we we are already outlining another continuation of the story um which we'll probably end up doing it maybe either the end of this year or maybe we might do it in the, almost in the same window as we did in 2020 at the beginning of 2022 but yeah we've we've got an outline we've got a couple of different subjects that we we think would be worth exploring because i guess the main thing now since we've had stress to kill was about like you know I guess, social impoliteness and general kind of rudeness of people. This one's about, you know, opioids and pharma. So the next one, we want to also have another subject rather than, um, you know, so we're going to, you know, so we've got a couple of things in mind. So I would say, uh, I would say almost with certainty that there will be another one and we'll most, yeah, it'll probably be out like, uh, well, well, out at least shoot um, in 2022. I, I would, would not say it'll shoot this year because I mean I personally have like about two or three films between now and the end of the year so um that won't be happening this year um but definitely um definitely next year which brings me to my next question what what will we be seeing next from you what's what what's coming down the pipeline <laughs> um, so the one that's completely set um I'm doing a film um that's produced by um a guy Jeff Miller and Mark Mark Lester um, that's called Bring Him Back Dead. Um, Jeff's done a whole heap of um, whole heap of movies, and Mark's both produced and also directed movies like you know Commando and Firestarter and you know Class of 1984. So yeah, we're doing a sort of like a sort of like a sort of Jim Thompson style kind of thriller. Um, so doing that in um, at the end of uh, the very end of June, or rather, I'm going, I'm 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 leaving for the end of June, and we'll shoot that through July. And then after, and then um, yeah, then beyond that, I've got um, I've got another project which is like in a sort of almost a sort of La Femme Nikita type of film that I'm doing in in Washington State. Um, like, ah, uh, call me when you're you in Washington State. Oh, yes. okay. Cool. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you know when we're there and get you along. Get you to come along and have and and um, um and visit us. Yeah. So. I'm working with that with a um, a producer named Alexi Angelino um, and also her brother Sean um, and it's going to be a sort of star um, very a young really talented actress named Sanae Lutzis. Um, she she'll she'll play a sort of like sort of like a girl who inherits a job as an assassin because there's something else that happens in her family. Um, so yeah, working on that. Uh, also working on something involving a, um, a producer. Tim Chisma uh, that involves a, a a killer on a sort of like um, a killer who's actually disabled. 
and and he goes on a he goes on a he goes on a killing spree. I mean, it's not quite as simple as that one. And then one in um, another one in Mes and one, another one in Mississippi. So yeah, I've, there's a bunch of stuff at the moment which is um, sort of all at various stages, but pretty much all kind of ready to go. So it's just pretty much a matter of just kind of like lining it up in terms of when to do it, so you got time, so you got kind of like time. So yeah, so that's all. Um, yeah, it's kind of exciting at the moment. So many projects. Do you sleep? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, no, not very well at the moment. I got a lot of <laughs> yeah, I mean, because I do a lot of writing, but I also have co-writers, you know, in, you know, like, um, you know, working with Tom and another writer too, David Richardson, who's also one of the writers on Painkiller, because essentially Painkiller um, was uh, really Tom, myself and David also did some scenes as well. So I've known David for years, going way back um, to my uh, work in Australia. Um, so that was... Um, so yeah, I just like to keep busy because I always feel that, you know, when the opportunities come along, you're going to make the most of the opportunities. And, um, you know, hopefully each film gets a little bit better. I mean, certainly I learn more each time, each film I make, you know, and I, I mean, I think you're always a student in a way, you know, you're always a student of filmmaking that there's never a point when you go, I really get it. I really know how to do this well, because yeah, I mean, every filmmaker at some point, including myself, you know, make, make shit, you know, make stuff that's trying to go shit. What happened there? I mean, you never intend to make shit, but you know, but also at the same time, you also, you can never make a film. Everyone's going to like, you know, you know, you, you sort of make, I, I tend to make the kind of film I'd want to see. Um, I mean, cause that's really, that's the only person that you can, you can pretend, or at least the only person you can hope to represent is yourself and going, well, yeah, hopefully, as, as someone who loves movies myself, I see a lot of movies. I, you know, I definitely watch like hundreds of movies a year. So I, I'm pretty obsessed with it. So I figured that I, I try to make something I would like as a, as a movie goer, um, you know, but at the same time, you know, I, at the same time, I understand that some people just won't like anything I do. Other people will like some stuff I do and that's fine. You've just sort of got to accept that, you know? Yep. Well, I want to thank you so much for speaking with me. Um, Thank I you. loved Painkiller. Um, I had you. a great conversation with Bill over just a couple of days ago about it too. Um, well, Bill's fantastic. Oh yeah, I mean, if I can just add add that Bill is truly one of the greatest actors I've ever worked with, and he's he's just like there's just nobody like Bill. <laughs> really, there's no one like him. Also, his professionalism, his focus. Um, he has amazing ideas as well. You know, he you know when Bill says, "I've got an idea, Mark. I want to ask you something." Uh, it's never something trivial. It's always something really, really substantial that he wants to add. He's got a good suggestion. And it's mm -hmm. also not necessarily about, you know, giving himself more screen time or whatever. No, it's, he has really, really good solid ideas. So yeah, I hope to work with Bill on a, on, you know, um, lots more projects. And there is a dream project both of us have been um, working towards, which looks like that might happen soon, a film called Circus of Dread. So Ooh. that's getting closer and closer to happening. So um, I'm nice. really happy. Um, I'm really happy about that. Right on, right on. Well, again, I really hope Painkiller is a success. Um, and I really hope people get the message of it because that is a growing crisis here. And especially in the United States, it's not just opioids, but prescription yeah. painkillers in general is becoming yeah. a huge problem. And um, yeah, and yeah, right. and I thank, thank you. So and much. now that I have you here, just to make sure that I, I thank you for Stress to Kill, also because I really <laughs> loved that movie. Also, oh, thank it you. was thank you. It was very much like a much darker version of um, like Falling Down with Michael Douglas. Right, like it right, was just right. yeah, it was just I was like oh yeah oh. yeah. <laughs> oh, well, well, thank you. That's um yeah, you made me, you made my day. That's <laughs> that's great. And Bill, yeah, and Bill in that, I think it's um. You know, it's just like Bill and the scenes, the scenes also a bit with Bill with Amanda Sante in that, I thought were just um, really great. They had a really interesting chemistry together. And um, so, yeah, it's, you know, I'm hoping that some people might watch Painkiller and then, you know, go back and look at, you know, go back and look at Stress. That'd be good. Um, that was the first film Tom and I made together. And um, it was, um, you know, you know, you know, we're, you know, we're very happy with it. But the reason I'd say one of the reasons we didn't call this film Stress to Kill 2 is because we wanted to keep the focus on the painkiller aspect and also didn't want people thinking, well, I never saw the first one, so I'm going to avoid this one. You know, right. so that's why we kind of just didn't make it. And it's not it's definitely not a direct sequel. You know, yeah. it's more like taking the characters. Well, you've seen it. You know, it's just taking two characters from that and just kind of pushing them into this into this story. 
But thank you. I really uh, appreciate that, Ronnie. No, thank you. <laughs> and everyone that is watching this, make sure that you go see Painkiller. Um, you'll be able to just, you know, as usual in a video, go down to the description, click the link, and make sure you visit Mark's uh, IMDb page because he's got a lot of other great projects on there that you guys are going to want to see. And again, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Bernie. I appreciate it.